Martin Logan didn't invent electrostatic loudspeakers. In fact, they go back a hundred years. You see electrostatic speakers getting developed in the early 20s. The world's most famous private laboratory did a lot of research, and the speaker that they all liked the best, meaning the most accurate, was the electrostatic designs they had. The people that were working with the technologists were blown away, even at the early stages, on how coherent that front wave of sound sounded. Electrostatics had their upside in terms of accuracy, but they were not quite as practical as a piston or magnetic speaker. The material was uh, pig intestines that had been honed razor thin and were leaved with gold to be conductive. It sounded great, the engineers were blown away with it, but it didn't smell so good. The electrostatic of the 50s and early 60s, they had limitations. They were harder to drive, you needed more powerful amps, they didn't have deep bass, and really you had to sit in one spot to get the best effect. Now with all those drawbacks, they were beloved by music lovers, by audio critics, people that loved opera, people that loved jazz because of their accuracy. It really wasn't until the late 70s when our founder, Gail Sanders, started questioning how to improve. That was Martin Logan's dream and goal and driving force. It was to be able to preserve the good elements of electrostatics, its accuracy, and get rid of the problems. And one by one they did. Let's talk about the parts that make up a classic electrostatic design. It's all about a thin diaphragm. That's the driver that pushes the air molecules to your ears so you hear sound. Now that's suspended between the stators, two metal panels that receive the audio signal coming from the amplifier. There are spars that set the gap that go in the middle that prevent the film from excurting too far, and these are spaced in different places to also help tune out resonances. That sandwich is essentially the electrostatic speaker. The beauty, among other things of this, is the simplicity. Our diaphragm gets its charge from household electricity, which travels into the speaker and encounters a power supply. That power supply converts the charge into a positive bias of a few thousand volts, depending on the size of the speaker, and it stays constantly biased that way. The stators are receiving their charge from the music signal via the amplifier and the black and red wire. The actual audio signal goes into our cabinet, and inside there is a step-up transformer. It knocks almost entirely out any current amperage but boosts up the voltage, and that voltage is applied to the front and the back. Now those are opposite charges, yet fully equal in strength. Because of the steady positive charge on the film, when the rear stator is negative, that stator is actually pulling it, and at the same instant, the front stator, which is positive, is pushing the film. And as the music, millisecond by millisecond, pulses into the speaker, it flips back and forth. Positive, negative, positive, negative. Push, pull, push, pull, speed it up to real time. It's moving tens of thousands of cycles per second. This is a mimic of the air pressure that was from the original music signal. One of the advantages of the electrostat is the uniform full surface drive. The force is uniform across the entire diaphragm. That means whether the edge, the center, any portion of the diaphragm is being pushed and pulled at the same time. As opposed to a cone speaker where the forces are generated on the voice coil, which is then glued to the former, which is then glued to the diaphragm, and then the sound has to propagate across the diaphragm before it can be coupled to the air. It either grabs it on the rim, the edge, and the center has to follow, or it's grabbed at the center and the edge has to follow. That is a form of distortion. Our diaphragm is much lighter than the typical cone diaphragm relative to the forces of the air that it's moving. There's so much area that the coupled air mass is actually higher than the mass of the diaphragm itself. Any amount of lag is actually distortion. So the brilliance of the thin film is that its low mass, coupled with the relative strength of the electrostatic field, allows this to be far and beyond anything out there in terms of starting and stopping quickly. What that means is you're perfectly tracing the original music signal. The beauty of our speakers is the virtual absence of these phase distortions, the kind that come when a diaphragm is moving just a little too slow, or when a diaphragm is not fully uniformly driven. 
those subtle but audible distortions are absent from an electrostatic speaker. A crossover takes signal from the amplifier and separates it into high frequencies and low frequencies. A typical cone and dome based system, you may have a two or three way crossover. So when you look at a tweeter and a mid range, or maybe there's multiple mid ranges, they're adding more and more parts, more and more complexity and more stuff in the signal path. Ideally, we'd like a speaker with no crossover, one transducer that plays 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Unfortunately, we don't have that, so we have to split the signal. The key is no crossover in the mid-range. In the mid-range is where our greatest acuity of hearing is. The last thing you want to do is put a crossover right where we hear the best. Between 2,000 and 5,000 hertz is where we do most of our listening. And unfortunately, most manufacturers build a crossover right at that point that adds coloration to the sound. The diaphragm and electrostatic can cover from beyond human hearing way down into the bass area. Therefore, there's no need for a crossover that goes right where your hearing is at its greatest. For our hybrid speakers, the sound is split between a woofer and the mid-range and tweeter are all put into one transducer. So we only have one crossover. This gives us a good combination of deep bass with the precision of the electrostatic transducer. The ESL panel has controlled dispersion. Controlled dispersion reduces dramatically room interactions, so you hear more of the sound directly from the speaker and less sound from room reflections. If you put a box speaker with a tweeter in it, the dispersion pattern is enormous. It's 180 degrees in all directions, which means that the sound waves within just a few milliseconds begin ricocheting, bouncing off the floor, the ceiling, and the sidewalls. And when those early reflections arrive to your ears too closely to the intended main reflections, acoustic chaos occurs. It doesn't sound good. An ESL panel has a lot more surface area than a cone or a dome. A tweeter would only be this big around, and a mid-range might be this big around, whereas an ESL has quite a bit more area, as you can see. One of the main advantages of all the surface area is that it gives you the control dispersion. A small device like a tweeter will radiate everywhere, but as you get wider and taller, the sound starts to be more directed in the correct area. The curvilinear design. It was an inspiration by Gale to solve a huge electrostatic problem, which was the beaming effect of a flat panel. The listener is in great shape, settled in the very middle, but anyone off to the side is out of luck. What we get with a 30 degree curve is a nearly ideal wave launch into a typical home room. It's just broad enough that it's inclusive to a listening position, but not broad enough to quickly reflect off the sidewalls. You get even more control dispersion because it's dipole. A dipole is a speaker where sound coming out the front is in phase and sound coming out the back is out of phase. The diaphragm is moving back and forth, so when the air in the front is pressurized, the air in the back is rarefied. And the waves, they cancel on the side because you have a negative wave here and a positive wave here. They add up in the middle to nothing. So if you listen to an electrostatic speaker on edge like this, you won't hear anything, whereas if you turn it towards yourself, you hear quite a bit of sound. The sound is coming out of both the front and the back. It translates to the ear as a pleasant, natural, acoustic effect. The dipole sound in a room mimics that sound of natural acoustic instruments the best. We're associated heavily today with the electrostatic speaker. We certainly didn't invent it. Many greats came before us. One could say that Martin Logan took the torch from the forebears of electrostatic designs and has been carrying it ever since. We're talking 30 years of ongoing developments that have allowed us to solve the many problems of the early generations and increase the performance of the electrostatic technology. In the end, you get your speakers home, you take them out of the box, put on your favorite music, and it'll all hit you. My gosh, this is real music in my house. Nothing else can do that the way a Martin Logan can.